Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to give this talk. So yeah, as Francesco mentioned, I'm going to talk about a complex K theory of dual pigeon systems. So this is a joint work in progress with uh, Xi Shen. And just so you have an idea what this talk will be about or what the structure will be. So first I'm going to recall the basics of the theory of fixed bundles and the modelized spaces. And then we're going to talk about the connection with uh, Langlands duality and neurosymmetry. And in the third part, we're going to, you know, ask the question or pose the question whether there could be an integral version of, of this mirror symmetry relation for modelized spaces of fixed bundles. And we'll see towards the end that the answer is yes, uh, with uh, the right notion of integrality and the right notion of the right cohomology theory. And in the last uh, part of the talk, I'm going to discuss the proof or given a quick overview of the proof. All right, so let's start with uh, Higgs bundles. So um, <clears throat> for this talk, we're going to fix a smooth proper curve X, and we're going to consider the following data on this curve. So a Higgs bundle is a pair consisting of a vector bundle E, a holomorphic or algebraic vector bundle E, together with a so-called Higgs field, uh, theta. And so theta is simply an O-linear map from E to E tends to omega one X. So you can think of this as a, something like a twisted endomorphism of the vector bundle E. Twisted endomorphism because the sheaf of one forms is a line bundle. So essentially, locally you could represent this Higgs field really by a matrix uh, with its entries being one forms. And so the modelized space MX is going to be a variety parameterizing so-called uh, semi-stable Higgs bundles. So there's an additional uh, stability condition that needs to be imposed on the, the Higgs bundle uh, in order to get, uh, you know, sufficiently small model problems that can be governed by a variety. But yeah, this is uh, something you're all probably very familiar with, so I'm not going to dwell on that point. And so one additional assumption that we're going to make is that the degree of the vector bundle and the rank of the vector bundle are co-prime. And this guarantees that stability equals semi-stability, and in fact, uh, also that the, the variety is smooth, the modelized space is smooth. So here are a few facts, interesting facts about this modelized space. So M of X is holomorphic symplectic, and uh, there's a map or a morphism called the Hitchin map or Hitchin system which is actually an algebraic integrable system. So this is simply a morphism from M of X to a, a, a complex vector space or to an affine space, a complex affine space, such that it's, it's generic fibers in the abelian variety. And furthermore, you could show that this generic, that uh, all the fibers are in fact uh, Lagrangians. So that's why you would call it a, an integrable system. And yeah, this map is also uh, proper. And so one consequence you can get from that uh, immediately is that this modelized space cannot be compact or proper. It, it's really a, just a general quasi-projective variety. And so there's some variants of this modelized space that we're going to be interested in. So the so-called SLN modelized space and the inverted commas uh, will be defined uh, on this slide. And so before defining the SLN modelized space, I'm going to quickly recall the definition of the actual SLN modelized space. So this one is simply given by the modelized space of semi-stable Higgs bundles with a trivialized determinant and where the Higgs field is assumed to be trace-free. So this is called the, SL the actual SLN modelized space because those pairs here satisfying this condition can be uh, modeled by SLN torsors with a Higgs field. So that's why the notation is entirely justified. But yeah, the, the downside of this definition is that modular spaces are always singular because the determinant condition forces the degree to be zero. And hence uh, the coprimality will be violated. And so if n is greater than one, you end up with singular modular spaces. But this can be fixed uh, by making the following uh, variation of this definition. So you, you start by uh, fixing a line bundle L of degree D. Again, these assume to be co-prime to N. And you define M superscript L SLN of X to be the modular space of semi-stable Higgs bundles. 
where the determinant is assumed to be isomorphic to L and the trace of the Higgs field is again assumed to be zero. And so this is what we're going to call the modular space of SLN Higgs bundles under inverted commas. And as a useful, as a useful shorthand notation, we're going to introduce uh, M hat of X. So there are also uh, PGLN Higgs bundles and the corresponding PGLN modelized space. Um, this one can be constructed as a quotient stack of M hat. So all you have to do is you have to introduce this group gamma given by the n-torsion point of the Jacobian. So well, keep in mind that n is equal to the rank of the Higgs bundles we're working with. And this group gamma acts on the SLN modelized space just by taking the, the tensor product with uh, the line bundle corresponding to such an n-torsion point. And if you take the corresponding quotient stack, you end up with what we would call the, the PGLN modelized space or the modelized space of PGLN Higgs bundles of degree d. And another way to define this, uh, so this is actually a, a stack because we're taking the quotient stack. So I probably shouldn't say modular space, but yeah, by, by force of habit, this might happen uh, once in a while. So yeah, this is really an, an orbit fault. And another way to construct it uh, would have been to take the, um, the GLN modular space and quotient by the Jacobian itself. All right, so now uh, let me say a few words about this, this Hitchin map that we've already alluded to on an earlier slide. So I think I already mentioned that locally you could think of the X field as something like a matrix, but with the entries being uh, one forms. And so the Hitchin map is simply given by computing the characteristic polynomial of this matrix. And so the, the actual presentation of the matrix doesn't make any difference, doesn't affect uh, the characteristic polynomial. So you end up with a well-defined map, <clears throat> which is just given by singling out the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. So th those coefficients will now be sections of tensor products of the sheaf omega one X. And so the space of those global sections is by definition, the Hitchin base and the map that associates to a Higgs bundle, the characteristic polynomial is by definition, the um, Hitchin map. And I already mentioned that the generic fiber was an abelian variety. And so this is something you can see quite directly using just these linear algebraic definitions. So in fact, uh, the generic fiber is not only an abelian variety, it's actually the Jacobian of a smooth curve, which is uh, called the spectral curve. And the spectral curve is the, the end to one cover of X that you obtain by computing the eigenvalues of the Higgs field. So computing the the n eigenvalues of the Higgs field, you end up with an n to one cover. And so generically, this curve will be, will be smooth. And uh, the space of line bundles on the spectral curve can be identified with the generic fiber of the Hitchin map. Right, so now I wanna talk about um, what happens when uh, looking at two Hitchin systems for um, Langland stool groups. And so we're mostly going to do this for SLN and PGLN, which is like the, the first pair of, uh, of Langland stool groups that is kind of non-trivial because the, the group GLN is, uh, is self-dual. And if you're not familiar with Langland's duality, I assume that you all are, but if you aren't, then let's just you know say that this is some duality notion that was introduced by Langlands that is based on the classification theory of reductive groups. So from the point of view of a geometer, the actual definition isn't very enlightening, but it's, it's somewhat fascinating that this notion of duality pops up all over the place and very often it casts a, a shadow in geometry. So we're going to see an example of this uh, right now. So for instance, in the case of SLN and PGLN, uh, it was observed by uh, Housel and uh, Tedius that um, the abelian vibrations <clears throat> that arise when studying the SLN and the PGN modelized spaces, those abelian vibrations are actually dual to each other. So what does this mean precisely? So if you take a generic point of the Hitchin base, then as I told you earlier, the generic fiber on both sides will be an abelian, will be an abelian variety. And it so happens that if you compute 
the fiber and the SLN side first, that it will be dual to the abelian variety that arises on the PGLN side. And so this is a result for the SLN and the PGLN modelized spaces. But something similar is true on the level of GLN. And this is a, an even more classical result um, because for GLN, I mean, GLN being a self tool, Langland self tool group, you'd expect the generic fiber to be a self tool abelian variety. And this is indeed uh, known to be the case for Jacobians of, of smooth curves. And as, as you know now, the, the generic Hinchin fiber for the GLN space happens to be the Jacobian of the spectral curve. And I'm just going to remark in passing that this theorem by Hausel and Tedius uh, can be generalized. And so this is work by, by Donagi and Pantev. Um, so they observed that if you, so there's also a notion of GX bundles for G being a reductive group. And so they observed that uh, you can identify the Hitchin basis. And so I was a bit liberal with the use of the word canonical. I think unless the, the groups are simple, that probably isn't a canonical way. And even then you probably only get something which is canonical up to, up to scalar. So let's just say the Hitchin bases are, are isomorphic, but then pretty much the, the same phenomenon happens. So if you compute the generic fibers, you end up with abelian varieties that are dual to each other. And so now this, this you can really think of as some kind of uh, geometric incarnation of, of Langland's duality. All right. But yeah, how so much, this is just how much of this survives for the singular fibers? Yeah, very, very good point. Um, we're going to talk about this in a in a moment. So we'll see that for for certain singular fibers, I mean, there's a result by by Rinkin, for instance, that works for you know the, the groups GLN, SLN, and PGLN. You you can extend this duality to some kind of derived equivalence. And so this is the case for the so-called elliptic locus, where the, the spectral curves are, are integral. And then there are also extensions of that result um, to non-reduced spectral curves. Yeah. And so in, in general, you'd expect that this is true everywhere. But actually, this is somewhat, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to mention that uh, on, on a later slide. Yeah, thanks for your question. So given this uh, duality relation between the Hitchin fibers, you definitely expect uh, that this has some influence on the, the cohomology of the, the modelized spaces. So it's a very reasonable question to ask how the cohomologies of the SLN and PGLN modelized spaces compare. And so this is the question that was asked by Hausel and Tadeus for Higgs bundles, but much, much earlier, actually, already in 75, uh, Hauden and Nara Simhan proved the following result, which is maybe like the first instance of, uh, of this kind of mirror symmetry relation. But they were working with modelized spaces of, of just plain vector bundles. And so they observed that uh, the singular cohomology groups with rational coefficients of uh, the SLN space and the PGLN space are isomorphic. And so they, they proved this theorem using arithmetic methods using the, the weight conjectures. So essentially they just compared to the point counts. And so what's interesting from the point of view of geometry is that since the space on the right-hand side, the PGLN space, is a quotient of the SLN space. This implies that this finite group gamma is actually acting trivially in cohomology. So this is definitely you know, an, an unexpected result and, and quite a nice one. But the same phenomenon isn't true for modelized spaces of fixed bundles. So the action of this group gamma on the modelized space of SLN Higgs bundles is um, in a way quite, quite complicated. And that's also why it's uh, much, much harder to um, prove anything about uh, a comparison between the, the cohomology groups. So let's first talk about the, the expectations. So um, as, we, as I just mentioned, uh, the generic fibers of the SLN and the teacher and modelized spaces are dual abelian varieties. So based on the FYC philosophy, uh, you'd expect um, that the SLN space is a mirror partner of the PGLN space okay. and vice versa. Okay. Um, and so this is indeed what was conjectured by Hausel and uh, Tedius. And so based on that expectation, they conjectured that the Hodge numbers of the SLN space 
should be equal to appropriately defined Hodge numbers of the Pichy length space. And so since the Pichy length space is really an orbifold or a dolly Mumford stack, the right notion of Hodge number uh, is given by what you'd call the, the stringy Hodge numbers or the orbifold Hodge numbers. And furthermore, you have to take into account a, a chirp that naturally lives on the Pichy length side. And so this chirp induces corrections uh, for these uh, stringy Hodge numbers. And so Hausel and Teddy verified in, in low ranks that uh, these two numbers matched up with the SLN side. And so this inspired the, the conjecture. But of course, uh, a big portion was also this SYC philosophy, which is, uh, and the fact that the two spaces have dual uh, abelian variety vibrations. Let me briefly say a few words about this orbifold cohomology, stringy cohomology that appears on the right hand side of the conjecture. So if you ignore the chirp, this is simply cohomology of the inertia stack. So you just take cohomology of fractional coefficients of the inertia stack. And since the PGLN stack is really a quotient stack, you can make this very explicit. So this amounts to the following direct sum indexed by elements of the group gamma. And you're just taking the cohomology of the, the fixed point loci. So M hat gamma quotiented by gamma and the rational cohomology of, of that. So this amounts to the cohomology of the inertia stack. So essentially you're seeing that in orbifold cohomology, you're counting the, the, the inertia strata or the fixed point loci with some kind of higher multiplicity. And this leads to some notion of cohomology that for some questions, it's just more, more appropriate than just the, the plain cohomology of the orbifold that would agree with um, just the cohomology of the course modelized space if you're using rational coefficients. And so something that's interesting to remark here is that those individual summons that appear on the right-hand side can actually themselves be understood as modelized spaces or stacks of Higgs bundles on a finite detail power X gamma of X. Or you could also think of them as modelized spaces of Higgs bundles with respect to some group scheme on X that is somehow twisted in a funny way. So now what about um, alpha twisted orbifold cohomology? So orbifold cohomology that uh, takes the chirp into account. Well, essentially this is some kind of version of the, the usual orbifold cohomology, but with respect to a, a twisted coefficient system. So just some local system that lives on the inertia stack. And there's a very uh, direct way to produce such a local system. So the formalism essentially takes care of it. So a chirp uh, you can think of as a morphism from m hat to uh, b2 mu n. So yeah, those chirps are actually always uh, defined over groups of roots of unity that have the finite order. So that's why we can take a map to b2 mu n. So this is just uh, the classifying morphism of the chirp. And then we apply the inertia stack functor. And on the left-hand side, well, we just end up with the inertia stack of the p length stack. And on the right-hand side, we get the inertia stack of P2 mu n, which you can identify with, um, okay, so unfortunately, there's a typo here. You can identify this with P mu n times P2 mu n. So here, there should be a P2 mu n. And then you're simply um, taking the projection to the first factor. So you, you end up with, um, a map from the inertia stack of the Pichu lens space to be mu n. And this is the classifying morphism of a mu n torsor. torsor. And now essentially you just take the associated unitary local system and the cohomology of this twisted system of coefficients is the orbifold cohomology that is twisted by the chirp. All right, and so now I just explained the full meaning of this conjecture by the Hausen and Tedius. And so in, in 2017, Lies, Ziegler and I, we, we proved this conjecture. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, that's why I'm restating it as a, as a theorem. And so we, we use um, Piedi integration uh, that was introduced by Batyrev. 
And <clears throat> so previous cases have been known, of course. Um, so for instance, the ranks two and three uh, were established by Hausel and Tadius in the original paper using uh, a Moss theory strategy. And in uh, 2014, uh, Boccalini and Grandi verified the so-called uh, Hilbert scheme cases using a uh, Gretsch's formula. So certain families of modelized spaces of fixed bundles can be uh, understood as, uh, as Hilbert schemes of surfaces. And so Boccalini and Grandi, Grandi used this, this formula to, to verify uh, the hausel tedius conjecture in these cases. But unfortunately, I think this got never published. And then uh, also in 2017, uh, Goffin and Oliveira proved the uh, cases of Frank two and three for uh, modelized spaces of parabolic fixed bundles, again, using uh, Morse theory. So when I say Morse theory, it just means you use the natural GM action or circle action that exists on the, on the modelized space. Then essentially you, you try to understand the, the fixed bundle of sign computer, the cohomology. And so in, in upcoming work, uh, Xiu Shen uh, proves um, that was Tedius conjecture for modelized space of parabolic Higgs bundles in arbitrary rank, again using uh, periodic integration. So this how, is how, uh, does the, sorry, how does the duality work with parabolic structure? Well, it's it's pretty much it looks pretty much the same. I mean, you just have to define the, the parabolic Higgs bundles, and then there's all, also a, a Hitchin map. And the generic fibers are again uh, dual abelian varieties. So it's the same parabolic data that you get on the on the two sides. Uh, on yeah, for SLN and the PGLN, that's, that's pretty much yeah, that's it. For for general reductive groups, uh, I wouldn't be sure. Yeah, but for SLN and PGLN, it's the same parabolic data. Yeah. I mean, you can like. You can do the same trick in, in the, the SLN and PGLN cases, right? That you define the, the parabolic modelized spaces for GLN, then you impose a restriction on the determinant, and then you take the quotient by, by some finite group to define the PGLN spaces. Um, but if you really want to see the details, you should wait for, for Xiu's uh, paper to appear. <laughs> okay. And so there are also some some new proofs and uh, methods that I want to, to mention um, that appeared recently. So for instance, in, in 2019, uh, Löser and Wies uh, revisited the Hausel and Tedius conjecture using motivic integration. So this means that essentially, you know, that the tool periodic integration gets replaced by motivic integration, but actually the, the structure of the proof uh, changed as well. I mean, they, they took a slightly different uh, viewpoint on the whole thing. And the upshot is that now you don't have to use arithmetic methods. So this is, this is a proof that purely works in over the complex numbers and in characteristic zero. So there's no detour via arithmetic geometry needed. And then another uh, new proof that appeared recently in 2020 is the one by Davish Maulik and uh, Jun Liang Shen. And so this is really a completely different approach. So they're using perverse sheaves. And so essentially there's a correspondence, the endoscopic correspondence that was defined by Engel that can be used to relate certain portions of the cohomology groups. And then uh, using the, the formalism of per sheaves and vanishing cycles, they could show that this uh, correspondence induces really an isomorphism as it should. And so this is really quite, uh, quite amazing because not only does it compare uh, the Hodge numbers or the Betty numbers of both sides, but actually constructs an explicit isomorphism that is well defined up to a complex scalar. And so, yeah, that's really wonderful to have actually an explicit map that allows you to go from one side to the other. So, kind of um, inspired by the existence of such isomorphism, um, you could ask a question like, what's the most general coefficient system? where this mirror symmetry relation holds, this hausel tedius conjecture holds. So for instance, could you take singular cohomology with, with integral coefficients, right? So I think it's a, it's a natural question to ask. Um, but yeah, I mean, you get shut down pretty soon because on the right-hand side, you, you find even in already in degree two, you find non-trivial torsion classes, but the left-hand side can be shown to be torsion-free in general. So it's clear that because of uh, this difference here, um, there cannot be 
a mirror symmetry relation for integral coefficients. And so the fact that the left hand side distortion fee is actually the, the first theorem of uh, Xi Shen and, and myself that I want to, to mention. So yeah, essentially this is true for both the SLN and the, the Qi LN spaces, but not for the PG LN space. But if you take singular cohomology with integral coefficients, then the, these cohomology groups are, are torsion free. And in uh, low ranks, uh, this result was explained to us by, by Tom Bird. And I'm, I'm going to say a few, uh, going to make a few remarks about how we are uh, approaching this and how we're proving this statement for, for general ranks. But yeah, I'm going to do this uh, on a later slide. So at first I want to kind of uh, continue with this philosophical uh, detour about what kind of integral mirror symmetry, symmetry relation one should expect. So I just explained that uh, this hausel teddius conjecture doesn't hold with uh, singular, for singular cohomology with integral coefficients. And in a way that probably won't be surprising to the experts uh, because the experts will know that uh, Anakin, for instance, constructed examples of derived equivalent free folds that have non-isomorphic torsion parts in degree free singular cohomology. And similarly, uh, Troyman in 2019 constructed a t-dual pair of uh, flat free folds uh, such that the degree two and degree three torsion parts of the cohomology don't match up. Various the rational cohomology spaces happen to be uh, the same as you would expect from mirror symmetry. But there's a fix uh, to both of those uh, observations. So if you replace singular cohomology by a complex K theory, then in the case of Eddington's example, you get that the, the complex K theory groups are the same. And this is in fact always the case for fourier mukai partners. You can just use the fourier mukai kernel and it induces an isomorphism in uh, complex K theory. More about that uh, later. And similarly, in Troyman's case, uh, so Troyman proved that the degree zero complex K theory of the first uh, flat freefold set hat agrees with the degree one uh, complex K theory of the second flat freefold. So you have this kind of degree shift, and that's something that you'd expect just from the usual mirror symmetry relation for, for freefolds. And so kind of inspired by this, um, she and I started thinking about uh, an analogous uh, result for complex K theory of the SLN and the PGLN space. And this is indeed something that we, that we could prove. So this is our, our main result. Uh, so there is an isomorphism of the complex K theory of the SLN space with the complex, with the twisted complex K theory of the, the PGLN side. And so here, this is really a shorthand for gamma equivariant alpha twisted complex K theory of the SLN space. Or you could also think of it as alpha twisted Jacobian equivariant complex K theory of the GLN space. That's just because you really have to take into account that M check is, a, is an orbifold, is a, a dirty Mumford stack. So this is really some equivariant K theory group on the right hand side. But you don't have to add a, a subscript like orbifold or stringy because equivariant complex K theory is automatically the right orbifold version to work with. That's like one of the, the marvelous things about complex K theory. And so I, I wanna emphasize that actually we do a little bit more than that. So we're actually constructing an equivalence of, of spectra in the sense of uh, omega spectra, so the sense of stable homotopy category in the sense of stable homotopy theory. And uh, so yeah, the statement we're actually proving is that the complex K theory spectrum of the SLN side agrees with the twisted complex K theory spectrum of the right hand side. And we're not just doing this out of vanity. I mean, spectra really play an important role in our argument. Um, it's necessary to pass through stable homotopy theory to get this statement that the uh, the actual K theory groups are isomorphic. So omega spectrum are really an integral part of, of the argument and are, and are indispensable. 
And in case you're unfamiliar with spectra, um, you could think of them, I mean, this is uh, <laughs> it's dangerous, of course, but you could think of them as something like a, a chain complex. But in, in principle, it's like a, it's a very complicated topological space. So for which in particular, you can define a notion of homotopy groups and those homotopy groups will always be abelian and they are defined even for negative values. And in a way, this is kind of similar to the cohomology groups that you can compute for a chain complex. But the spectrum is really a more refined object. And it's in this case, it's, it can capture a lot of information that a, a normal chain complex wouldn't be capable of, of capturing. So that's in particular related to complex K theory. Um, so we know singular cohomology for space can be computed by taking the cohomology groups of a chain complex, the singular chain complex. But this statement isn't true for, for complex K theory. There you really have to replace chain complexes by, by spectra. Okay. Um, so yeah, let me continue with some remarks about this, this theorem. So the, the left-hand side can be shown to be torsion-free. Actually, this is going to be, um, so I saw that there's a, a question just going to quickly finish uh, my sentence. So the left-hand side is torsion-free because uh, singular cohomology is torsion-free. And torsion-freeness of singular cohomology always implies torsion-freeness of complex K theory. I'm going to explain the, the argument on a later slide. And since the left-hand side is torsion-free, you'd expect that the right-hand side is also torsion-free. And so that's, that's the case. And it's actually something that we need to establish first in order to deduce that the map we're constructing is actually an isomorphism. And so now there's a, a question. Uh, is there an explicit description of the, the loop spaces uh, of these spectra? Um, so I would say, yes. I mean, even of the, the spectra them, themselves. I mean, so I, I guess you're referring to uh, those spectra, right? The, the K theory spectra of, of some space M. And so you can really think of this as some kind of uh, mapping object or mapping spectrum from M hat to K theory, to, to the complex K theory spectrum. And this complex K theory spectrum, you can describe quite explicitly, for instance, by taking um, the space of Fretholm operators on a separable Hilbert space and uh, some, a bunch of other kind of explicit descriptions like that, that you could use. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the point that I was trying to make earlier is that so since the left-hand side is torsion-free, you have to show that the right-hand side is torsion-free too. And so this happens to be the case, uh, which is you know, quite, uh, quite remarkable. And it kind of fits with some general phenomenon that is observed uh, once in a while that passing from singular cohomology to complex K theory sometimes annihilates just the right amount of torsion. And so yeah, this is really quite a, quite a remarkable thing. And I want to make a few, few remarks about that. So I planned this uh, quick detour, which is actually unrelated to the, the topic of this, <laughs> of this talk, but it somehow fits with the overall philosophy. Um, so um, it's about curve and surjectivity. So you might uh, recall that uh, in the 80s, Francis Curvin proved this, this nice theorem about uh, Hamiltonian spaces. So if you take a, a compact Lie group G and a Hamiltonian G space M, which has a proper moment map mu, and zero is a re regular value of mu, then uh, Curran proved that um, the equivariant K phi, sorry, the equivariant uh, singular cohomology of M with rational coefficients surjects so onto the cohomology of the symplectic quotient, again, with rational coefficients. And probably as was already known to, to Francis Kerwin at the time. So this subjectivity statement fails with, with integral coefficients. You can salvage it a little bit by imposing some additional conditions. So this is uh, something you can find in a paper by Tolman and Weizmann from uh, 98, but there is no statement as general as the theorem for rational coefficients. Unless you're brave enough to take another cohomology theory and so this is what uh, Harada and Landweber, Landweber did in, in 2005. So they proved that curve and surjectivity holds for complex K theory. And this time it's not necessary to, to rationalize or to excise the torsion part. So in a way, 
this is really in line with what I just said earlier, that because you pass the complex K theory, you're really annihilating the right amount of torsion from, from singular cohomology. The right amount meaning that a statement like current subjectivity is true in this case. So now I, I wanna give you a quick fact sheet about complex K theory because um, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page and for the, the second half of this talk, it will really be essential to know a few things about how this cohomology theory is actually constructed and just know a few uh, facts about it. So um, KU star is a two periodic cohomology theory. So this is uh, also referred to as a spot periodicity. So you're free to either think of it as being graded by uh, the integers modulo two, or you can think of it as, as, a, as a cohomology the theory that is graded by all the integers, but which is two periodic. And so explicitly an element of KU of zero of X can be constructed in terms of uh, topological vector bundles, complex vector bundles on X. So now here I'm using X to denote a finite CW complex. And so such a vector bundle E gives rise to an element that you usually write as uh, brackets E. And it's this construction is compatible with uh, direct sums. So the bracket of the witness sum agrees to just the sum of the two, two brackets. If you construct a universal group that is holds the, the group, the group, then you've got your definition of KU zero of X. And there's a, a spectral sequence, uh, the so-called Atiyah Hirzebruch spectral sequence that relates complex K theory with singular cohomology. The second page of the spectral sequence is given by singular cohomology with coefficients in KU Q of a point, which is just a funny way of writing the integers if Q is even and zero otherwise. And so yeah, the spectral sequence converges to the, the complex K theory groups. And there's a funny thing happening, namely after tendering with Q, the spectral sequence degenerates uh, on the, the second page already. So all of the differentials uh, vanish after tensoring with Q. And so this implies that the, the differentials can only be non-zero on um, torsion classes. So using those properties, you get the following. So first of all, you get this very nice identification of rationalized complex K theory with a two periodic version of rational singular cohomology. So KU star of X tensor with Q is isomorphic to H star of X with coefficients in, well, you could think of it as a, as a chain complex essentially. So this is something like a, a hyper cohomology group. So Q, you just take the Q algebra generated by some degree minus two element uh, beta. And so this essentially imposes a two periodicity on, on singular cohomology. And thanks to the two periodicity, you can relate it with rationalized K theory. And so on the numerical level, this implies that the ranks of um, the complex K groups can be identified with sums of Betty numbers. Are you either restrict to Betty numbers of even degree or off degree? And another thing that you obtain from the Atia Hilzebrook spectral sequence is that uh, torsion freeness of singular cohomology implies that complex K theory is also torsion free. So this is a property that I'm already, I've already alluded to on an earlier slide. But I wanna emphasize that it's possible for KU of X to be torsion free, even if integral cohomology isn't. So this is really you know, confirming that passing to complex K theory can annihilate some, some nasty part of torsion that you wouldn't know how to deal with on the integral cohomology side. So the great thing about uh, complex K theory is that there's a very nice uh, equivariant version of it. So if you have some group acting on your space X, then you can simply replace plane vector bundles by, by G equivariant vector bundles. 
and this yields uh, equivariant k theory. And so informally, you should think of this as being the right k theory of the, the corresponding quotient stack or orbifold if, if g is a finite group. And furthermore, if you have a, a chirp, which is a g equivariant on x, then you can define a alpha twisted g equivariant complex k theory, which is uh, defined by using alpha twisted equivariant vector bundles. And so it's pretty much the, the same idea. And so here maybe I, let's just, if you're unfam if unfamiliar with what these words mean uh, concerning uh, chirps and uh, twisted vector bundles, then I would propose that you just ignore them, ignore the chirp and uh, yeah, because I, unfortunately I didn't prepare any slides explaining this in, in more detail. But if you just uh, brush the chirp under the rug, you you won't lose a lot about it. It's just in order to get the right, uh, in order to get this isomorphism, it's really necessary to have the chirp there. And so there's a, a very nice result by Fried Hopkins and Telemann from 2002, which uh, relates this alpha twisted g equivariant k theory after complexification with um, complexified two periodic orbifold cohomology of the, the quotient stack. So here I'm assuming that um, g is a is a finite group because otherwise, I mean, there's still a statement. I mean, they prove a, quite a general result also for, for compact key groups, but I, I, I shouldn't call it a orbifold cohomology in this case. So the, the formulation would be slightly different. But for G being a finite group, and so that's the case that interests us, this, is, uh, this formulation is fine. And so now if you, if you contemplate this result by Fried Hopkins Telemann, and uh, you compare this with uh, the isomorphism that Shio and I pr produced, and you see that uh, my result with Shio is really something like an integral analog of the household Tedious conjecture. Because after rationalization, what, what you obtain is just uh, an isomorphism between the two periodified, complexified, orbifold cohomologies of the Pichelin side with the two periodified. <laughs> complexified singular cohomology of the Esselin side. OK, so that's essentially concluding uh, the motivational section where, where I explained why um, this is really a, an analog of the Hartle tedious conjecture for, for complex K theory. So now I want to say a few words about uh, the strategy that we use to, to establish this result. Um, so in brief, uh, the idea is to, to use a Fourier Mokai kernel to construct a map between um, the K theory groups. And then you just have to come up with a way of showing that it's actually an isomorphism. And so in this case, so if you have uh, two smooth schemes which are proper over a common base, um, X and Y, then um, you can take a Fourier Mokai kernel and rather than directly writing down a map between the derived categories, you can also use it to uh, define a map between the K-theory groups. And here, essentially, you're replacing, all you're doing is you're replacing the push forward along a proper map by some kind of wrong way map that exists in, in complex K-theory. But otherwise, it's the same construction as the one used by, by Mukai. So you take the pullback of some class E on X, you tensor with the kernel, and then you push the whole thing forward to Y. And this defines a map from the K theory of X to the K theory of Y. And the beauty of it is that this also works equivariantly and uh, in a twisted setting. So something that is a little bit less obvious is the fact that um, this um, map is also in using a map of sheaves of spectra relative to the base S. And so here I mean sheaves uh, with respect to the standard topology on the associated analytic space of S. So you take complex points and you use the standard topology in that. But yeah, if you just start with, it's a, it's a bit of a leap of faith, but one can show that this Primo Kai construction also induces a map of sheaves of spectra 
but you take the push forward of the complex K theory sheaf on X to the base, and you take the push forward of the complex K theory sheaf on Y, and then this fully Mackay transform and uses a map between the two. Um, so it's it's not at all obvious that this is true, because yeah, I mean, at least to me, it's not obvious because I mean, like in the definition of these fully Mackay transforms, you have these wrong way maps, and it's not at all clear that they are sufficiently um, coherent to actually write down a, a morphism between sheaves of spectra. And so because of that, uh, we're using a, a different uh, viewpoints to actually show the existence of this, this morphism of, of sheaves. So we use a theory that was, was developed by, by Blanc and by, by Moulinos. So I'm going to start with uh, Blanc's results. So by a Dici category, um, you can either mean the the classical thing, uh, complex linear DJ category, which is pre-triangulated, or you could think of a C-linear stable infinity category. But whatever you choose them, so law proof that there's a functor from DJ categories in this sense to a spectra. So this is a, a functor between uh, infinity categories. And this functor is called a K-top, topological K-theory. And it has the property that it sends uh, perfect complexes on X viewed as a DG category to the K-theory spectrum of X. And so this really means the K-theory spectrum of the an analytic uh, space. So this means just the complex points of, of X. And there is a generalization of this result to a relative setting. And so this is due to uh, Tassos Moulinos. So if he proved that if you take some complex space scheme S, then there's a functor from uh, the infinity category of S linear DG categories, two sheaves of spectra on complex points of S. So this functor is uh, denoted by K top subscript S. And it has the nice property that it sends um, alpha twisted perfect complexes on X to the twisted K theory sheaf on, on X. <laughs> so here I, I should have probably written alpha twisted perfect complexes on S ascends to the, the twisted K theory sheaf on S. That would have made more sense. Okay, yeah, sorry for the, for the typo here. And so Moulinos also proved that um, this construction has a certain compatibility with uh, proper push forwards. So this compatibility is not entirely general, unfortunately, but so what is true is that if you take a proper morphism S to S prime, and you view perfect complexes on S as uh, an S prime linear category, then uh, topological K theory relative to S prime can be shown to be isomorphic to the push forward of the sheaf of, sheaf of spectra given by uh, topological K theory relative to S of perfect complexes on S. And that's by definition or by, by the statement here above, it's the same thing as just the push forward of the complex K theory sheaf. Uh, so there's another question whether sheaves of spectra are related to parametrized spectra. Um, on the spot, I, I can't give you an answer, unfortunately. So the way the way we are thinking about sheaves of spectra, and that's the same for um, Blau and Moulinos, we're just using the notion of you know of sheaves on on, a, on an infinity topos. So this sounds really really fancy, but essentially that's the notion that you can find in either higher topos theory by Lurie or in uh, spectral algebraic geometry. But you know heuristically speaking, you're just associating to you can think of it as a functor from the the category of open subsets uh, ordered by reverse inclusion to the infinity category. Of spectra, so this gives you the definition of a pre-sheaf, and then you also have to have some kind of hypersheaf condition that needs to hold. Yeah. All right. And so now, essentially, uh, this theory by by Blau and Moulinos is really uh, saving us here, because now we can just apply uh, this functor k top s to the actual Fourier Mukai transform, so to the actual map between DG categories. And then, uh, so with a little bit of work, this gives us exactly the morphism of sheaves on complex points of S that we wanted. So this way, we really get this this Fourier Mukai, this com this relative Fourier Mukai transform between the push forwards of the K theory sheaves. And and so that's also an advantage of working with that formalism. 
This also works in a twisted equivariant context. So in the equivariant context, one has to be a little bit careful. Um, so in our case, this is fine because we're working with um, equivariant K theory with respect to a finite abelian group. And so in this context, it's easy, it's sufficiently easy to kind of generalize uh, the results by blowing Moulinos to, to this setting here. But in the general equivariant uh, context with twists, uh, this would be, would be challenging. So now, um, so where are we now? So we, we've got this map between the, the sheaves of spectra. So now we can just uh, simplify the whole thing by, by tensoring with the rationals. So this means we take the, the smash product with the, like the allenberg mclean spectrum associated to the, the rationals. And so now by essentially the identification that I stated earlier, of the K theory of complex K theory rationalized with two periodified singular cohomology. You can think of this simply as a map between sheaves of chain complexes. So that's not just an, a map or a morphism in the derived category of chain complexes of, of the rationals. So now we just get this morphism from RF star QX uh, beta beta inverse to RG star QI beta beta inverse. So this is now definitely a much, much simpler object to, to work with. And so at this point, uh, because we are now working with rational coefficients, it makes sense to, to evoke the, the decomposition theorem by Balins and Bernstein, Dunin and Kaber. So according to which um, the derived push forwards are sums of shifts of semi-simple perverse sheaves. And a semi-simple perverse sheaf being the middle extension of a semi-simple local system and some locally closed sub variety that is called to support. It makes sense to actually, you know, concentrate the whole analysis of this Fermi uh, equivalence on the supports of these uh, lo of these uh, locally closed sub varieties. So, in particular, if you assume that you can show that this Fermi transform is an equivalence over every perverse support. Then this implies right away that the rationalized Fourier Mokai transform on, on the level of K theory, rationalized K theory, will be an equivalence as well over the full base this time. So this is this kind of amazing uh, cohomological spreading out phenomenon that happens when you use perverse sheaves that you can kind of prove general statements about singular fibers by restricting attention to fibers with. Um, same singularities and kind of singularities that are easier to manage. So now, uh, under those assumptions, uh, what we've got is that this Fourier-Mokai transform is an isomorphism after rationalization. And with a little bit of extra work, so this doesn't directly follow from that, but with a little bit of extra work, one can show that actually this original K-theoretic Fourier-Mokai transform induces an isomorphism of the non-torsion parts. So like the integral lattices uh, of KU star of X and KU star of Y. So in particular, if you know for another reason that these K groups are torsion free, then you actually succeeded in showing that uh, this map here is an isomorphism. And by, by the white lemma, it implies that the map of spectra is, is also an equivalence. So this is really a, a kind of a straightforward construction that is based on, on rationalization on the, the decomposition theorem. And of course, there's a um, kind of more profound parts um, that luckily for us were already taken care of by, by some other, other people. So one big problem here is you have to choose uh, the Fourier Mokai kernel, which um, doesn't have to you know, satisfy any conditions on the entire base, but on, on a sufficiently big open subset it needs to be a derived equivalence. And then on the same open subset as hard, we want to show that all of the per supports are contained in here in order to actually apply the, the program I just sketched. And then the third step, and so this is something that we have to do ourselves in, in this for this project, you have to show that uh, torsion vanishes on both sides. 
And so yeah, let's see whether this program can be can be realized in the case of the Hitchin vibration. Uh, so the answer is um, yes and no. So it doesn't work directly for the case of the Hitchin vibration you're interested in, but it it, it works to to a certain extent than in the other cases. So um, first of all, the Furimukai kernel. So here you can use the kernel that was constructed by by a Rinkin. So you just use the derived equivalence over the locus um, known as the elliptic locus. So that corresponds to uh, the locus for the spectral curves are integral. And so Rinkin constructs a derived equivalence of the HN fibers there, which can be used. And then you just take an arbitrary extension of a Rinkin's uh, integral kernel to the full Hitchin base. So that's actually a, a funny feature of our work that essentially you just need this kernel to be an equivalent in a sufficiently big open subset, but otherwise you can just extend it arbitrarily. And it will always give you an equivalence in, in K theory. And so now uh, what you have to do next is you have to slightly alter the moduli problem. So you have to work with Higgs fields that allow to acquire certain poles. So the easiest way of um, just um, describing that is by working with Higgs fields that are twisted not by the canonical divisor, but by some arbitrary line bundle, D, um, which is supposed to be of even degree, and the degree has to be at least uh, equal to twice the genus. Because in this case, the pair supports have been completely determined by De Caldo, De Cataldo, and they're known to lie uh, within the elliptic locus. And it's it's still um, an open problem to actually determine those purpose supports completely in the case where D is equal to the canonical divisor. So that's the actual modelized space of fixed bundles people usually work with. But yeah, if you kind of alter the modular problem slightly, it's possible to understand the supports. And now in order to work around this issue that the per supports aren't uh, known for actual Higgs bundles, we use a, a method that was introduced by, by Davish Maulik and Junliang Shen in the 2020 paper. So this is the, the vanishing cycle method. And it's, it's a very nice, uh, very nice observation here that um, you can essentially embed, uh, yeah, the modelized space of Higgs bundles into a bigger modelized space for which the purpose supports are known. And you can actually embed it as the degeneracy locus of some regular function. And now this opens up the possibility of using vanishing cycles to understand the cohomology of the modelized space of, of Higgs bundles. And so this is what um, Maulik and Jin Liang Shen did. So they showed that on if you work with Higgs bundles with respect to the divisor D plus a point, then there's some natural function f on the Hitchin base, such that uh, the sheaf of vanishing cycles applied to the push forward along the Hitchin map mm -hmm. agrees up to shift with the push forward along the Hitchin map of the constant sheaf, which is now supported on the modelized space with respect to defined with respect to the advisor D and not D plus P. So in a way, applying vanishing cycles allows you to remove a point from the divisor. This way you can increase the degree or decrease the degree and um, essentially still prove, um, prove uh, interesting statements using the decomposition theorem, but this time for the higher degree versions of tomorrow spaces. And so essentially what uh, she and I had to do is we had to prove an analogous result of this for, for sheaves of spectra. So here you also take the, the push forward of the constant uh, K theory sheaf of spectrum on the SLN modelized space defined with respect to the divisor D plus P. And if you apply the vanishing cycle for the same function F that was defined by Bandik and Chun Ling Shen, then you get up to shift um, just to push forward of the K theory uh, sheaf on the modelized space of expandals defined with respect to the divisor D. So notice that the point P has disappeared when you apply the, the vanishing cycles. And the same thing is also true with um, a sheaf theoretic version of Alpha Twisted equivariant uh, K theory. So that's the part in red. 
And there is the first part is really just a straightforward uh, generalization of the proof of um, the re result by uh, Maulik and Xin Ling Shen. The portion in red requires some, some new ideas because we're working with, with equivariant K theory here, which isn't actually a, K, uh, a cohomology theory in the, the classical sense. It's really an equivariant cohomology theory. Okay, so this part is, is kind of not a straightforward generalization. And so now we are, we're almost done uh, with um, describing the, the proof. So essentially what you do is you kind of, you use the construction of this Fourier Mukai transform for one of the modelized spaces where the purpose supports are understood. So for instance, for D plus P, and then you apply the vanishing cycles. So now you get a map between sheets of uh, vanishing cycles of these push forwards. But those you can identify just with push forwards of the sheaf of K theory spectra for the actual modelized spaces you care about. But the one issue is that you no longer know that the map is given by, by a Fourier Mukai transform. So this is the one thing that you lose. Now it's just some, some map of, of sheaves of spectra. And then by <clears throat> from that, by taking global sections, you obtain a map between the, the K theory spectra that you wanted to relate. And if you repeat that process at least twice, you can use this to get a map between the, the complex K theory spectra of the modular space of SLN Higgs bundles, this time defined with respect to the canonical divisors you want, to the modular space of, uh, of PGLN Higgs bundles. And you probably spotted that now on this slide, I'm suddenly also twisting the SLN side and this is something, some twist that will disappear once you've taken global sections, but it's it's necessary to include it in order to describe the map between the, the sheaves of spectra. And then you can argue just uh, in the, the outline I, I gave you previously, so you can show that this map of spectra is an equivalence after rationalization. And you have to prove that uh, torsion vanishes on both sides. And from that, it follows that you get an equivalence. And so I think I'm, I'm already out of time, so I better, I better stop here. Um, but yeah, essentially, if, if you're going to look at my, my slides, I'm sure that Francesco will, will publish them on the Slack channel. You see a quick sketch of the proof of, of torsion freeness for the rank being uh, a prime number um, for SLN and, and PGLN. OK. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there questions? So Can I ask the... Yeah, uh, go on. I heard Davish, I think. Oh, I, I just wanted to ask, so, so the, uh, the, the, the gerb on the SLN side, is that just the canonical gerb associated to the SLN moduli space, or is it? Something else. Yeah, precisely. I mean, there, there are some, you know, you might have to take a power of it depending on how, what, which line bundle you choose. But essentially, these, these modelized spaces you can represent as quotients of some variety by PGLN. So this means that you always have a canonical PGLN torsor on these modelized spaces. And that's the origin of the chirp. Right? If you just take the classical. Uh, GIT construction, for instance, think of the, the character variety, it's kind of easier. So there you yeah. just take um, this kind of, you know, this equation of matrices and then you quotient by conjugation. So this is really a quotient by, by PGLN. And so this defines a PGLN torsor in the, in the co-prime case. And that's the, that's the chirp, yeah. up, to, up to a power, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah the... Yeah, so yeah, is, is your, what is your uh, Fourier Mukai kernel that you're using? Well, um, so we're using a Rinkins kernel in the case where the divisor has, you know, degree at least 2G and is even. And then we just take an arbitrary extension of this kernel. So just any extension is a coherent sheaf on the fiber product will do. So essentially you just need this kernel to, you know, give you an equivalence on the elliptic locus. And then through the magic of perverse sheaths, whatever the extension you choose, it's going to induce equivalence between the complex K theory groups. 
So there is a question on the online, which is related to that. So there is no canonical choice, or does this isomorphism you get in the end depend on this choice of extension? Um, a canonical choice for the, the kernel, you're saying? Uh, yeah. and, and does well, the isomorphism in the end depend on this choice? Well, in a, in a way, in a way that there should be, I mean, you, you could definitely, you know, I actually think that you can extend a uh, Rankine's kernel to big enough open subsets such that in the end, you could just take some kind of push forward and it would probably be coherent. So that there should be canonical choices like that. If those are the, the right kernels to work with in order to get a direct equivalence, that's a different question. Um, in a way, you have a lot of liberty when constructing those kernels. So for instance, if you want a canonical choice because you have some group action in the picture, then you could quite easily construct a coherent extension that is compatible with this, this group action and hence will produce a, a map of kind of, you know, Borel equivariant k theory spectra or something like this. Um, can I ask, what, what is the monogamy automorphism of the vanishing cohomology of this section? Um, can you just repeat the question because people are Yeah, the monogamy and the vanishing cohomology. Um, so I, I think this is something I'm not going to, <laughs> to answer in public. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> sorry, I, I can't tell from the top of my head. Maybe a simple question. question. Oh. Go on, Davish, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So in the, um, you know, in, in, in my paper with Jun Liang, there was this kind of, you know, uh, scalar ambiguity, uh, which is, is that, um, I mean, has that basically been rigidified in your argument then? Is that? Um, I mean, so remind me of where is the scalar ambiguity coming from in, in your paper? Oh, I mean, I can't remember now. Yeah, there was, you know, at some point we trivialized like a line bundle over a point or something like that. So, I, I mean, oh, you, okay. know, like, you know, so it was, it was that kind of thing. It wasn't like. Okay. I mean, I, I think so. so. A trivialization like this also appears, but just in order to define the map to A1, right? I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, something like that. That's right. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, I, I think this just means that, you know, this, these maps define, they depend on this choice of the regular function. Yeah. And in order to define the regular function at some point, you have to, you have to trivialize some, some fiber of a line bundle, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's the, the maps we get, I mean, there are probably several of them. And I think this is related to the monogamy question that uh, was asked previously. Yeah. Um, and somehow what, what happens in our case, I mean, you can, Actually, because you set up some kind of derived equivalence first for, for certain spectral curves, right? And essentially, you know, you just, you have to choose, you start with some component of, of the, the SLM model space or some, some choice of the line bundle, and then you choose to chirp accordingly on the pitchel inside such that you get a derived equivalence, which then you just extend brutally to some integral kernel on the full base. So, yeah. Now I have one naive question. How does this, um, how does Tadeus isomorphism is supposed to behave with respect to ring structure? Or is there a natural ring structure on the orbital plane? Um, so I, I don't think there's a nice compatibility with, with ring structures. Um, like already, already classically, right? If you, if you look at the case for n is equal to one, I mean, then essentially you're just take, getting you know, the Jacobian self-duality of the Jacobian, and you would look at the map induced by, by the, the Fourier Mukai self-transform of the Jacobian, which, you know, on the level of derived categories intertwines tensor products with the convolution product. So just because of that, I don't expect that there would be, there certainly shouldn't be a amorphism of cohomology rings, but it might, you know, it might satisfy something like kind of Hecke transform compatibility, like similar to what, in, what you see in geometric Langlands. Um, so this is the kind of statement you could, you could hope for, but uh, we're not claiming anything along those lines. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? 
If not, then let us thank Michelle again.